The Alaskan Panhandle is a stretch of coast in southeast Alaska known for its rugged beauty and difficult terrain. Because of the area's difficult geography has a long stretch of mountain ranges, swaths of dense forest, and huge islands separated from the mainland by deep fjords and swollen glacial rivers. Many places in the Alaskan Panhandle, especially those far from big cities, have poor infrastructure and few people. Most people living in the area are industrial workers who use the area's many natural resources. Forestry, mining, fishing, and canning are the main industries that keep the Alaskan panhandles going. Denise Welsh, an Alaskan businesswoman, born in 1904, became well-known in the salmon canning industry after being named president of the Bellingham Canning Company in Yarta. After her husband, Denise's sudden death stood out in a field where men usually do most of the work. When she was named president of the Bellingham Canning Company, she was the first and only woman to run an Alaskan canning company. Even though she was the only woman in a job that most men did at the start of the 20th century, Janice Welsh rose quickly to the top of the canning industry by hiring mostly local Native Americans. Unlike many of its competitors, the Billingham Canning Company did very well. It paid its employees wages that were very competitive. Due to the success of the cannery, Welch bought a majority stake in the Ice Strait Salmon Company in Hunter, Alaska, in 1946 and became its president. Janice Welsh and four of her best friends went to the Cache Islands on July 9, 1958. These islands are near the Bellingham Cannery. They went to the islands to picnic and pick some of the wild strawberries that grew there. After the picnic, two friends said goodbye to the rest of their small group and began rowing their skiff back to the mainland. With a big rush of water, the part of the island they were standing on fell into the bay below, and the rest of the island soon followed. The two people in the boat saw Janice Welsh, Robert Tibbs, and his wife being thrown into the air. Janice Welsh and Mr. and Mrs. Tibbles were never seen or heard from again. Their deaths would be the first in a string of tragedies caused by the tremor and lead to the deaths of several more people. Latu Bay is about 160 miles south of Yoka in Todd Bay on that day. It is a secluded cove cut by glacial runoff from the huge glaciers tower over its deep eastern sides. The deepest point in Latu Bay is 720 feet, which is very deep. Boats that want to get away from the steep sides of Latu Bay must go through the very narrow entrance. Even though no people live in Latu Bay, it is a peaceful haven for mariners along a long stretch of coast where there are no other protected inlets. Back in Yeeta, Janice Welsh, Mr. and Mrs. Hibbs, and Mr. and Mrs. Hibbs all died on July 9, 1958, when an earthquake hit. To try to climb Mount Latu, nine climbers packed up their gear, left the Tuya Glacier, and went into Latu Bay. They had planned for a local pilot to pick them up on July 10, but he showed up on July 9 around 8 p.m. and insisted that they leave before sunset. After quickly loading their gear onto the plane, the climbers left the three small fishing boats that had spent the night at Latu Bay and returned to civilization at 9 p.m. Two people were on board the three fishing boats, the Edgerly, the Sunmore, and the Badger. The Sunmore and the Badger were run by two Mary couples, the Wagners and the Swansons. The Edgerly was messed up by a man named Howard Ulrich and his seven-year-old son. The Edgerly chose to anchor in a small cove in the southern part of the bay, which was farther from the water than where the other two fishing boats were. At 10.16 p.m., the earthquake's tremors woke the sailors up. The earthquake had ruptured the fair weather fault, a part of which runs directly beneath the eastern part of Latoya Bay, where the sunbeam was anchored and the badger was in the cove behind the sunbeam. In the distance, a wall of water so big it was hard to imagine was quickly building up toward the eastern shore. As huge amounts of rock and glacial ice fell into the water, they moved quickly to leave the area as soon as possible. The Swansons on the Badger quickly pulled up their anchor and started moving through the bay's narrow entrance. The Wagners on the Sunbeam, who were closest to it, followed behind them. Howard Ulrich tried pulling up his anchor on the edgery, but the chain got stuck. He knew he couldn't get away from the rushing wall of water. He put a life jacket on his son and started the engines after fully letting go of the anchor chain. He was going fast and hoping for the best. Howard Ick could get back in control of his boat and steer it through the foaming, Debris filled water after the wave lifted it several hundred feet into the air and over his crest. Speaker 1, 559, the wave washed quickly over Santa Tav Island in the middle of the bay and under the edgery, breaking the anchor chain and sending Rick flying into the hole in the boat. The Swansons and the Badger realized they wouldn't get to the entrance to the bay before the huge wave got to them. So, they turned their boat around to face the wave again. The Swansons looked down from the back of their boat at the treetops and the end of Latu Bay. 
At the same time, a wave pulls the boat up into its curling crest, and a badger sits on the crest of the wave as if it were floating in the air. The boat was thrown off the top of the wave and into the water below, which was now a long way below them because the force of the wave was pushing them towards the breaking edge of the wave on the other side. Mr. and Mrs. Swanson escaped from the wreckage of their boat together in their skiff because they used a chair as a makeshift paddle. The Wagners were in the sunbeam, but they did not have the same good luck as the people in the other two boats because the wave took away the paddles of their skiff. As the tsunami got close to the mouth of Latu Bay, it crashed down on them and washed them away with a huge wave of water and debris. They had just finished leaving Latu Bay when the wave hit them. We haven't seen Mr. or Mrs. Neither Wagner nor any sunbeam fragments were ever found. By 11 p.m., the edger had left Latu Bay in safety. Howard sent out a mayday call, and a nearby ship heard it and came to help. The Swansons were in their boat, and Howard's mayday call led a nearby ship to find him and bring them to safety. Edgerly moved toward the entrance while avoiding huge chunks of glacial ice, uprooted tree trunks, and other debris in 20-foot waves. It was clear that the wave was huge, but it wasn't until the next day that its full size could be understood. On July 10, a geologist from the area named Dan Miller flew over Latoya Bay in the morning. Miller quickly looked at the dirty bay full of trash and the broken hills around it. He also noticed that the slopes no longer had a thick canopy of trees over them like they used to. It is the tallest wave ever measured. At 1,720 feet, it is taller than the roofs of both Old World Trade Centers. The trim line was used to measure this height. Because there was no video or picture of the wave, it's almost impossible to imagine what it might look like. But just for fun, I made a very simple Photoshop click baby graphic to show how big a wave like that would be, even though you should be very careful with this picture. Aside from the trim line on the northeast shoulder, the tremor had broken off 40 million tons of rock from the northeast slope, which caused the second highest trim line on the southeastern shore. But this first 1,720-foot wave crashed into the northeast shoulder of Latoya Bay and washed over its side. This made a diagonal wave that moved toward the southeast end of the bay before breaking over the spit at the entrance. When the power of the water lifted the glacier, it broke apart because of the rush of rushing water and less pressure from above on the earth below. This caused an underwater landslide that moved more water than the falling rocks and ice. Since then, people have learned that many big tsunamis have hit Latu Bay in the past, but this one was probably the biggest one up to that point. Even though there was a lot of damage to buildings and infrastructure near the earthquake's epicenter in Yita, only the five people shown in this video were killed. The huge tsunami of 1958 left clear marks on the coasts of Latu Bay. If more people had existed in either place, the damage and deaths would have been much worse. If you enjoyed this video don't forget to subscribe to our channel.